Good morning. It is a pleasure to see you. I know it is cold, and it gets hard to get out when it's as cold as it was this morning, but you are here. You made it, and we're warm inside here, so I appreciate you coming this morning. A couple of announcements to be made. The year of, no, yes, the end of year financial statements are available for pickup here in the Narthex on the table. Please take yours home today so we don't have to spend 55 cents mailing it out when you could have just got it right here. So uh, please take a look at that. And while you're at that table, the February grapevine is out. So pick up a copy. And if you are viewing and think, you know, I'd like to see a copy of that church's newsletter, just email the office and get on the list. It's that easy. And we'll get you an email copy. They've got a quiz every month in there. Okay. Any other announcements to be made for the good of the order? I don't think so. So let's prepare ourselves for worship with confession and forgiveness found on page three of your worship folder. Please stand. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, that we may delight in your will Walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right, our opening hymn, please stand. We praise you, O God. Hymn 870.
Lord, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. You may be seated. first reading is from the first chapter of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. We will read the psalm responsibly. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. For you are my hope, O Lord God my confidence since I was young. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If
If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove, remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for the prophecies, they will come to an end. And as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For well, we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Then I became an adult. I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And, and now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, heal thyself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things we have heard you did at Capernaum. And then he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, where the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except for a widow in Zarephath in Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except for Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue was filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him up to the brow of a hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. U.S. Congressman Willard Duncan Vandiver, who served the United States House of Representatives from 1897 to 1903, was a member of the U.S. House Committee on Naval Affairs, and he traveled to Philadelphia in 1899 to attend a naval banquet. It is perhaps legend, or perhaps truth, that at that function, in a speech, Congressman Van Diver said, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cockleburs and Democrats. 
And frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You've got to show me. And that might be the origin of how Missouri became nicknamed the Show Me State. There's another less flattering story about a time, about the same time, 1890, something like that. And when a group of Colorado lead miners in a town appropriately named Leadville went on a strike. The mining company brought in a bunch of lead miners from Joplin, Missouri. Where, however, Missouri lead mining and Colorado lead mining use significantly different techniques. And the Missouri lead miners needed to be educated in their new environment. So Colorado pit bosses were constantly having to tell their Colorado miners who were not on strike, that man's from Missouri, you're going to have to show him. But it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Because we all know what show me means. It means to prove it. All this came to mind when I was looking at this week's gospel lesson. It's a common story. We have it here every three years. It's the second half of a longer story that began with last week's reading. And Jesus has returned to teach in the synagogue in his hometown in Nazareth, in the region of Galilee. And I've preached it many times, but I'll be honest. I don't really have a good, solid understanding of what that phrase, physician, heal thyself. What does it mean? I mean, Jesus knows what it means. He knows, obviously, his audience knows what, they, what it means, because they're about to use it, according to him. And it's something that everyone seems to know. Everyone except poor old Pastor Lance in West Columbia, South Carolina, who had to preach on that this week. Now, I want you to think about going to a physician today. You see your doctor's degrees and licenses on the walls and in their offices. You live in a society that you know just won't let some guy who's a barber stop his job as a barber, swap out his hair salon sign, and put up medical practice, and then start writing people prescriptions and performing surgeries. That's not how we do doctors in this culture. But in the world at that time, it wasn't that way. The claim to be a doctor was held by well-meaning people who really felt called to help people heal. But it was also the claim of a doctor made by people that we call in America today snake oil salesmen, quacks, in it for the quick buck. So what is one way you could have known what you're getting? You know, are you going to be brought back to health by this guy? Or is he going to sell you some ditch water that's just going to make you sicker? Well, you know, well, he skips town with your money? Well, here's a way to know. Hey, Doc, if you're such a good healer, physician, Heal thyself. Show me. Prove it. I know I have tried to explain that Galilee in Jesus' day had a reputation that would basically be akin, you know, you know without, throughout the Mediterranean, they had the reputation of the same kind of stereotypes we use or West Virginia in the United States. But maybe Galilee had a bit of Missouri in it as well. Show me. Physician, heal thyself. Moreover, Galilee was a pretty rough spot. It was a hotbed of zealotry. Now the zealots were Jews who so resented what they considered the Roman occupation, 
They were openly violent and rebellious. And a couple of decades before the story we hear this morning, historically, not in Scripture, but a group, major rebellion in Galilee of zealots rose up against the Romans. And they created enough problems that Rome had to sweep in with a huge armed army. And they killed or enslaved up to 30,000 Galileans, 2,000 of which were marched down to Jerusalem to be crucified on the same day. I mean, it's a horrific scene. Can you imagine 2,000 crosses set up with 2,000 people hanging off them? But that's Rome's point. They're going to punish you if you try to rebel. That's the point. Those two guys on the cross of Jesus, crucifixion, it's, it's a misnomer to say that they were thieves. The actual Greek word is evildoer, and it was, crucifixion was generally the death reserved for rebellion. But, you know, 30,000 Galileans. That's just a little bit right before Jesus is born. Jesus and his family, Mary and Joseph, they would have known many people. Neighbors, business acquaintances, even perhaps some of their own distant family that were affected firsthand in an event like that. But thinking about it gave the whole reading, me to this point, a little understanding. Because the story unfolds in such a strange way. Jesus, at the beginning, is teaching. They're amazed. He congratulates her. He, he preaches with authority. Then someone says something along the lines, hey, you know, this fancy pants preacher, that fellow's from around here. His daddy helped my daddy build the house I was born in. How did he get to be such a big shot? And that's when Jesus says, well, I guess now is the time you're about to tell me, show me, prove it. Or you might say, I've done some miracles. And you, you'll want to see me do one. Go on, monkey boy, do a little dance for us. And Jesus goes on to remind them of the atrocious history that Israel has with prophets. He tells them some downright embarrassing stories from their collective Jewish past where God showed some favoritism to Gentiles over his own people, the Jews. Fast forward a few minutes they are throwing him out of town, driving him uphill, which is a process that did not happen without probably taking some spit in the face, a poke with a stick, a shove, a slap, maybe even a rock pelt or two. And they're about to throw him off the cliff to kill him. As they say today, well, that escalated quickly. But Galilee is a rough spot. So maybe we could understand it a little bit more easily, of why it went so quickly from great sermon to let's kill this guy. But also, as rough as it was, it was also Jesus' hometown. He had played in the fields around there. He had worked with his father side by side. He probably took his little brother to the well with his mother Mary, to the markets. His friends and playmates grew up with him there. They probably sat by one another in the synagogue. They learned God's law from the scribes together. And because all this story comes right on the heels of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness by the devil, it makes me kind of think it's a temptation story of its own. Because wouldn't the temptation 
Wouldn't the temptation be to want to do what the Nazareans are saying to him? The temptation is not give in to the urge to show them, to prove it. Isn't that what you would want to do? I would. Bring me that sick baby. I'll heal that screaming little punk, and then you'll know. You'll shut up then. You want me to prove it? I can prove it. Instead, Jesus resists the temptation. And I love that Luke doesn't tell us that Jesus says a word up there on the cliff where the threat of being thrown off to his death is real. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, we don't know. But I like to think he just stayed quiet and stared at them. Look, he looked at the man right in the eyes, the man he used to buy things at the market from. He looked at the young man who was the little brother of his childhood buddy. And then, this is so cool, he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. That's some Clint Eastwood style stuff right there. He just starts to move forward crowd divides before him, and he goes on his way. Because Jesus has a mission, and that mission, that mission is nothing less than the salvation of the world. And he won't be tempted to do anything other than that. As followers of Jesus, we have a mission, too. Our mission is nothing less than to live out the promises that God called us to in our baptisms. Now, they may have been spoken to us when we were baptized. And we may have repeated them when you were confirmed. And every time this congregation, we often do it on Pentecost, any time this confirmation does it, does the affirmation of baptism, we recall those promises again and again. And you know them. You are called to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people, following the example of Jesus and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Do you remember those words? You said them before. You've heard them many times. But, as experienced Christians, you also know that all those things, that entire list I just gave off, it's a lot easier to say those things than to do those things. Because we all face temptations. And there's a great tendency to set our mission objectives to the side, that list that we just said, to do all those things. Set those things aside and give in to our pride and win the argument. Give in to our pride and prove something to our adversaries. Give into our pride and, and, and look good in front of the people we grew up with. The temptations are real. But what is also real is the mission God has set you on. Let the people of God say amen. All right, our next hymn, please rise. O oh, Word of God incarnate, hymn 514. <laughs>
Remain standing as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. You may kneel as able. Almighty God and Father, guide your church in the ways of faith, hope, and love. Cultivate ministries and communities of compassion that bear witness to your enduring presence among us. God of grace, teach us to live in humility on the earth. Curb arrogance that leads to destruction of natural resources and disregard for future generations. Inspire the work of scientists who urge us to live in harmony with your creation. God of grace, you are the refuge of all who seek f hope and freedom. Accompany immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers who cross borders to find safety and opportunity. Embolden leaders to draft compassionate policies on behalf of immigrants and those who assist them. God of grace, love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Comfort with your love those who are lonely, fearful, or brokenhearted. Sustain the hope of all those who suffer in body or spirit, especially those on our prayer list and those we now name aloud or in our hearts. Your grace falls upon young and old alike. Bless the gifts of children in this, ministry, in this congregation and in this community. Give us humble hearts to follow their leadership. Inspire us with their laughter, their insight, and their curiosity. God of grace, we praise you for those who have gone before us and now see your face, and now see you face to face. Abide with us in this mortal life until we rest in the arms of your never ending, ever lending, never ending love. God of grace, since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift those and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We stand. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share God's peace. Please share God's peace socially responsibly.
Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the table where Christ meets you. Eat, rejoice, and be glad.
Please rise. Now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Pray together. God of wonder, in Jesus we behold the light of the world. Come near. As you have come among us now, send us out in joy, hastening to share the good news of your love. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is among us, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. All right, our final hymn is hymn 668, O Zion Haste. to love and serve the Lord.